Thank you very much, Noel. Uh, good morning. It's great to be here. It's wonderful to be in Edinburgh. It was lovely last night to meet old uh, friends from uh, the not-too-distant past when I was uh, running BBC News. I want to begin today uh, not with the big picture, we'll get to that later, but with a small one, and here it is. It's hard because I, I, you call a financial crisis, you're totally oblivious to it when you're in it. And so you just, it's day to day, I'm only just getting to the point where I was 10 years ago. You know, I wasn't aware, which seems a bit naive, but of what was going on elsewhere, because it wasn't a concern, because all I was trying to do is make sure there's food on the table, lights come on when you hit the switch, you know, it's got water, you've got heating, jobs are good in. That uh, was Earl Marchant, a single parent from Manchester, uh, which is a couple of hundred miles south of here, and he lost his job 10 years ago in the teeth of the financial crisis. And we put him at the heart of our 10th anniversary coverage of that crisis just recently, Coverage that also included long reads, digital videos, short explainers, as well as the more recognizable pieces on radio and on television. And I've chosen that clip because it says something quite simple, but also important about our journalism. Because our job, as it always has been, is to put Earl Marchant first. And by that I mean putting the audience first. How does he, and millions of people like him, make sense of a world which he's often told is in chaos, a world which can feel polarized, noisy, and full of, of misinformation. I believe our role is straightforward, to fulfill our responsibility to Earl, to the audience. But to do that, we need to look carefully in the mirror. We know just how many challenges we have to navigate. In fact, given our unique position, we have a duty to navigate. So what are some of those challenges? The world is interconnected, it's complicated, information moves fast, whether it's true or false, or, and isn't this the hardest, if it's somewhere in between? At the same time, the world is alive with activism and aggression, and a sense that if you do not agree with someone else, you're their enemy. And what happens if that enemy is powerful, a government, or those who enforce the law? Are you then the enemy of authority? It can feel like our profession right now is under siege, and that's wrong, and we shouldn't feel like that. There cannot be a more important issue for us as journalists, the ability to report without fear of reprisal. We cannot lose that, and as we've seen, the threat is growing, and the consequences are brutal. Some of our colleagues have died simply for being journalists, for doing their job. It's happening all too often across the world. But for us in the European Broadcasting Union, it's happening close to home, too. We have become far too used to the targeting and killing of journalists in Mexico or in Afghanistan or during the war in Syria. And we've recently seen the fatal shootings of five colleagues at the Capital Gazette in Annapolis. But look what's happening here in Europe, too. We've seen the targeted killings of investigative journalists. Daphne Caruana in Malta, and Jan Kusiak in Slovakia. Both, both shot dead when they were exposing corruption in their countries. It's hard to remember a time in which journalists across the world have been deliberately targeted in the way they are today. And the fact that is happening is utterly shameful and it's unacceptable. But of course, our colleagues face less extreme violence too. Every day we see aggression, almost a campaign to denigrate our craft. On Twitter, there are constant anonymous threats to journalists simply reporting on opinions that some might not want to hear. Some of the material that journalists have had to face is, quite frankly, disgraceful. It is an attempt to intimidate people and stop them doing their jobs. For the sake of all journalists, we need to defend our role, seeking out the facts, no matter how inconvenient they may be for others. Because journalism matters, whether you're in broadcasting, in the press, or working online. Whether in this country you're on the Mail, or the Mirror, the Sun, or the Guardian, the Times, or the Telegraph, the Express, or the Independent, we are all in this together. We're an essential part of society, and we all matter. And we need to stand together on this. 
and if there are ways in which we can work together to defend journalism, we in the BBC stand ready to work with others across the industry, wherever they happen to be, to do just that. But I believe those of us who are working in public service journalism have a unique role in that mix. We're not in the business of one-sided arguments. Our core value is impartiality, as fair a reflection of the world as we understand it. And in an era of dispute, I think that is one of our most precious assets. And the big question for us, given our role, is how we best serve our audiences. Have we done enough to tell stories in a ways that they want? Not top-down, broadcasting at, but horizontally, broadcasting with. What our younger audiences tell us is they want a conversation where opinions are given a fair hearing. They want our journalism to illuminate, to enable them to make up their own minds, their own decisions. And I want to lay out some of the ways in which we at the BBC want to respond to those big shifts, those big questions, and specifically the way they relate to us public service journalists. First, let's talk about the BBC agenda. I want, and I know our journalists want, to be tackling fake news, or actually what we should more properly call misinformation wherever they find it. That's one of our important roles. And I hope this clip now uh, explains in one very telling example the sort of thing I mean. These women and children are being led to their deaths. The soldiers accuse them of belonging to the jihadist group Boko Haram. In the final scene of this video, too graphic to show here, they are blindfolded, forced to the ground, and shot at close range 22 times. One of the women still has the baby strapped to her back. That's a story from Cameroon, an investigation by our Africa Eye team. The people who killed those women and their babies were Cameroonian soldiers. But that it even happened where it did was disputed by no less than the government. Fake news, they said. It was wrong. It wasn't them. But our journalists proved what the truth was. And it was a new kind of journalism. Of course, you have to start with expert reporters. That's absolutely vital, who uncover the facts. But they were helped by a deep understanding of how to use new tools, such as geolocation data and imagery. And in this case, actually working out on the pictures in the films exactly the mountain range where it was, therefore being able to locate it within uh, a few hundred meters uh, of, of where these awful things happened. And it went on like that. And that's the sort of journalism I want to back and we back. It takes time. It requires skill. It requires resources, it requires a commitment to, under, to uncovering what is real and what is not. Because what this story did was not just to show you what happened, it explained how and why, and it got to the truth, the men who actually carried out uh, that appalling uh, murder. And we want to do more. So from early next year, we'll be trading more journalists in the art of open source media, working with others to mine data to get to stories we otherwise couldn't cover. My second point also concerns our agenda, and it's this. Explanation is key. Whether it's in the US midterms or, or Brexit, uh, we must aim to report what has happened, but also explain why it's happened and why it matters. And that, it, it, in essence, is what public service journalism is about. It should run through our DNA. It's a vital part of our role. Without context, without explanation, everything can seem random, confusing, overwhelming. And if the world seems that way, no wonder many people find it hard to engage or feel they don't want to engage. It's impossible to make connections. It all becomes white noise. That's why it's so important for us to offer insight as well as headline, and our audiences expect nothing less. They tell us that they want the sharp piece of news, that bullet point. Of course they do. But they also want to go deeper into subjects at a time of their choosing. So our approach is becoming more layered, made up of three clear elements. Just what's happened, of course, what it means, and then the context and the detail. I'll give you a statistic that may surprise you. On the anniversary of the financial crisis, the most read piece on BBC News Online 
was a 5,000-word article on why it happened, what has been done about it, and why it still matters, which says to me, audiences want more than the soundbite. They want the understanding, and they want the detail. In short, explaining the news is as important as reporting the news. The third thing I want us to do more of is to enable audiences to judge who's telling the truth. Reality Check is our team investigating claims and counterclaims, getting to the facts and seeing through the bluster. It's doing a great job, but I want more. I want it to become central to our daily journalism so that the analysis is relevant and immediate. I think it's an essential tool for audiences on every big story that we do. And of course, we're helped in this push for context by the technology around us. There's so much more information out there, a flourishing world of facts and figures, and our job is to collect, to curate, and then make them available to our viewers, our listeners, our readers. Let's embrace data. Here's an example, and this idea came from our expert reporters, to tackle one of the subjects that we know audiences care most about, their health. It uses statistics to inform. It tells you exactly how your local hospital is performing. Without it, you'd struggle to find the data, never mind understand the data. The value of the service it's providing was recognized by the Royal Television Society this year and by millions of people uh, who've used it. It creates a different sort of relationship with our audiences, a much more personal one, because you know what? It's news that's actually useful to me. My fourth point is about specialism. First-hand knowledge matters. Journalists on the ground matter. It makes a huge difference to the authenticity of what we do. It leads to better journalism. You have local knowledge. You know people. We have experts in our service, BBC Monitoring, for example, that's constantly looking at who's saying what across the globe, working out where opinion or downright lies uh, are dressed up and masked as fact. We have people in a, in a little corner of New Broadcasting House who are expert on jihadists. You go and talk to them, they know exactly what's going on and who's saying what, or whether that's a lie or that's truth. We have specialists on all the big issues we face. Politics, economics, technology, science, education, all aspects of our lives. Journalists who know their business backwards. People who are able to judge on our behalf what's important and communicate that in a world where so much is challenged. And one of the BBC's great strengths is that our expertise exists in many different parts of the organization. To my mind, what was one of the biggest stories of last year? Plastics in our ocean. And who, where did that story come from? Sir David Attenborough, who produced it, our natural history unit and team in Bristol. But it's still news. The impact those programs had on audiences of all ages tells us how engaged people are and want to be with what's important to them. And that, I think, tells us something else about our journalism. We know that often, and quite rightly, news is about conflict, about argument, about clashes of people and ideas. But I think there should also be times when we step back from that and report on solutions. We shouldn't always just stop at the problem. We need to show much more what's being done and what the choices are. I mean, plastics is a problem but there are people working on how to solve, to fix that problem, and people want to know that there are answers to. My final point is about the people that we employ. News organizations should, in my view, have people from all sorts of different backgrounds arguing about what is news, what stories should be covered, and how they should be uh, covered. And that's why we must ensure we promote the full range of talents, regardless of gender, ethnicity, or social background, or whether they're disabled or abled. We are stronger as journalists if we make sure all voices are heard in what we do. And I believe that's true of all news organizations, big, small, global, or local. At the BBC, we're promoting that culture within our organization, an organization that I want to look and feel like the audiences we serve. I don't want people to simply fit in. I want people who are going to argue, who are going to change our tone, the stories we cover. This improves our journalism. What a strength we have in Nawal Agmarafi from the Yemen, Anne Soy, based in uh, Nairobi, Shingai Nayoka, based in Harare, specialists who've made a difference to how we report the world, bringing their insights to the whole world. Uh, and then, of course, not only globally, 
but pack here into Britain. We are stronger because of that. It's the stories they choose, it's the tone as well, a conversation, I hope, horizontal broadcasting with. We're all here today for a very important reason, because we all care deeply, passionately, about the future of journalism. What unites us should not be a shared sense of threat, but a sense of values. And that's why when I was asked, uh, would I be happy to take on the presence of the EBU uh, alongside the day job, uh, I, I couldn't resist it, I didn't hesitate. I haven't started yet, so maybe I'm seeing this optimistically, but I feel there's so much more we can do together to champion the values we stand for together, to share ideas, to share technology. Amy mentioned so many things that we could do together, and of course, uh, talent. At a time when resources for original journalism can be thin on the ground, the need for us to work together has never been greater. We have a long history together. The EBU has been sharing news content every day since 1962, and there's plenty going on among all the members. The Investigative Journalism Network, for instance, brings EBU specialists together to produce stories none of us could do on our own. We want to work with others. Our World Service Justice Week has done two amazing events on the challenges of fake news in Delhi, which I had a minor walk-on part in, and Nairobi, alongside Google, Twitter, and Facebook, working together. And the audience research they've done, which some of the social media companies co-funded, is illuminating for all of us and our audiences. Because what it shows is that young people want to understand the world around them. They want to see their worlds reflected in our journalism. That's why it's so great, by the way, to see 50 journalism students join us together uh, today. That's great, and from across uh, the world. I'm also going from here to launch another initiative, which is BBC Young Reporter here in Edinburgh this morning, aiming to give thousands of 11 to 18-year-olds the media skills that will help them distinguish a fact from fiction. And again, we can only do this by working with others together in our industry, in education, in charities, in governments. So my view is, let's do more. That can be our legacy, our gift to the next generation. The examples I gave, um, financial crisis, Africa Eye, your health, show to me why our role collectively is more important than ever and how much we can do for audiences, whether it's to explain the big global trends, whether it's to get to the truth and give a voice to people too easily ignored, whether it's to give you news that is local and valuable to you or global to help you make up your own mind. And that's what we're aiming to do the world over, bringing reliable, trustworthy information to parts of the world, to people where the outpourings of the official media can't be trusted, places where there's a real hunger for news, the truth, information, not fake news or propaganda. And don't let anyone ever tell any of us that our long, honorable trade is no longer fit for purpose. I have a huge confidence in our future. The big picture is a simple one. The public, I believe, believes in public service journalism. And there's never been a more important time to be a journalist. There's never been a time when our audiences need us more. We all have the right to be able to access information we can trust, because it's only by being informed that we can make effective choices about who governs us and about a whole raft of things in our lives. And our, journal, our role as journalists, therefore, is to empower people, to enable them to make up their own minds. We must help counter threats to democracy globally, challenging the scourge of disinformation, fake news, and holding those who produce it to account. It's the struggle of our time, and it's a battle we have to win. And I believe all of us who believe in the principles of public service have a responsibility to stand together, to fight to the integrity of news, and we will win. Thank you.